Hey guys, it's Stevie G here. Welcome back to another video. I hope you're all doing well. Today we're going to get straight into it. We're going to skip past the introduction as we've got a lot to cover today. The Sleeping Dragon Awakens. His name is Zhuge Liang. Now, in the West, a person's name synonymous with genius is Albert Einstein. In China, someone on a similar playing field is Zhuge Liang. So what defines Zhuge Liang's mode of thought? He is described as a Confucian-orientated legalist. Now, you've heard of Confucianism and you've heard of Taoism, but what you don't know is that these two philosophies are part of what is considered the six classical schools of thought in Chinese philosophy. And one of these other schools of thought is called legalism. And legalism can best be compared to what's known as real politik, aka Machiavellianism. A legalist text that most people are familiar with is Sun Tzu's Art of War. The ultimate goal of this philosophy is to consolidate order, security, and stability for the state. This class of individual was considered an elite back in the ancient times. Every ruler required that not only did they have military people, but they needed advisors. Civil advisors on the one hand to provide rules regarding taxation, infrastructure, what's the best way to manage the people, how to avoid revolts, and wider thinking military strategies. On the one hand you have something called a Da Du Du, a Grand Commander. This is someone who would lead your army into war themselves and play an important role in the army. And then on the other hand there's the military strategists. These are people who concoct long term strategies and ruses. A Grand Commander might say, let's put an ambush here. The military advisor might say, let's pay the enemies of our enemies to cause chaos. To be successful in this area, you need to be a polymath. Zhuge Liang was a military strategist, a writer, an engineer, and an inventor who would reinvent the repeating crossbow and the landmine. Famous works of literature include the still popular 36 Stratagems and Mastering the Art of War. Zhuge Liang is worshipped partially as a deity still to this day. But skipping past all of this, what can we say Zhuge Liang's longest lasting legacy is? Well, we're going to find that out. Going back to where we last left off, Zhang Fei, in a homicidal fit of rage, decided to set Zhuge Liang's house on fire. Liu Bei is kneeling on the floor, and Zhuge Liang stands up. Zhang Fei rushes into the scene and points his big fat finger in Zhuge Liang's face. It was I that started a fire because. Zhuge Liang, being the eccentric gentleman, brushes the incident off like nothing happened and says, well, don't worry, I needed a new house anyway. Yeah, people react differently back then. So, Liu Bei, Zhuge Liang, they start drinking over tea, talking about the affairs of the world. Liu Bei conveys his strong ambition to reunite the realm and bring order out of chaos. It's here where Zhuge Liang would reveal his greatest legacy, and that is the Long Zhong Plan. He tells him what he needs to do is take Jing province where he's currently stationed due to its strategic location. Then he would need to take Yi province which is current day Sichuan. Here there's an abundance of fertile land. In addition, Liu Bang, the first Han Chinese emperor, would use Yi province to strategically maneuver his way into the central plains of China in order to achieve hegemony. When Liu Bei finishes his conquest of Jing and Yi provinces, he'll team up with Sun Quan of the Southlands to defeat the northern Cao Cao regime. Liu Bei begs Zhuge Liang to join his team. Zhuge Liang decides, after years of being a hermit, he's finally found his master. However, Zhuge Liang's going to be put to the test immediately. Because Jing province where they are currently at is on the brink of a crisis. With the recent death of Liu Bao, a 14 year old Liu Song would take the reins. Sai Mao and the others convince their lord to surrender to Cao Cao as he's coming with a huge army. There's no way that they can beat them back so they might as well surrender. So Liu Song conveys his intention to kowtow to Cao Cao and with no fight being put up, Cao Cao simply walks in with his army and occupies Jing province. Cao Cao was ready to attack Liu Bei stationed at Xinye province and eventually go after Liu Qi at Jiangxia. Cao Cao has another thing up his sleeve. Cao Cao wants to relocate Liu Song, the rightful ruler of Jing province, to Xucheng. It's here in the capital that Cao Cao, just like with the emperor, would create a gilded cage for Liu Song and eventually have him murdered. In the year 208, Cao Cao would advance with half a million men to Xinye province to extinguish the light of Liu Bei once and for all. This would be known as the Battle of Changban. Liu Bei is sorely unnumbered and he needs a miracle. 
Here's the directions from Zhuge Liang as a military advisor. Guan Yu is to set an ambush of 3,000 men at the end of the White River. He is to give each of his men a sandbag each and dam the water. When you hear a commotion downstream, pull the bags. Zhang Fei with 3,000 troops is to set an ambush at Boling Crossing. Zhuge Liang, seeing Xinye as indefensible, covered all the houses with saltpeter and sulfur, and then asked Jiao Zilong to set up an ambush outside the city, and when the wind blows, he's to shoot fire arrows at all the houses in Xinye. However, Zhuge Liang is going to need more than a raging inferno to stave off this huge army of Cao Cao. Is to attack Cao Cao's army burning in Xinye, and to make sure that the East Gate is open. The Art of War talks about leaving an opening for a surrounded enemy and never pressuring a desperate enemy into a corner. When Cao Cao's forces leave in a panic, Liao Feng and Guan Ping are to have 2,000 men with them each, with half of them stationed to the left with a blue flag, and the other half stationed to the right with a red flag. All this with the intention of making Cao Cao too suspicious to want to attack this small force, thinking that there might be a plot to ambush him. When Cao Cao's forces retreat to the White River, Liao Feng and Guan Ping, with their soldiers of blue and red flags, are to chase them to Boling Crossing. However, before the battle starts, Liao Bei asks Zhuge Liang to cease and desist. There has to be another way. Liao Bei, hearing the houses in Xinye would be scorched to the ground, refused to abandon his homeless population. Zhuge Liang, knowing his lord, provided compensation provisions to all the citizens so they can afford safe passage to other provinces. But they refused. Instead, having fallen in love with their new leader, they decided to follow the honorable Liu Bei through thick and thin. Liu Bei had earned a reputation as a just ruler and people really wanted to follow him. So Liu Bei decided that if all these people were going to follow him, he would take them with him to Jiangxia where Liu Qi was stationed. But Zhuge Liang implored his lord to abandon the people as Cao Cao would be tempted to attack this slow moving caravan. However, Liu Bei wouldn't hear any of it. He didn't matter how much it cost him, he didn't want to abandon his people. With Xinye now abandoned by its populace, the chess pieces were now in play. Cao Cao's army would arrive to find Xinye a dead and empty place with no inhabitants left. Making the best of the current situation, they all settled into the abandoned houses and prepared to cook their food. Zhao Zilong, waiting in the shrubbery, would wait for the wind signal, and as soon as the wind came, an array of fire arrows would spring up into the night sky and burn Xinye. The saltpeter and sulfur mix would set Xinye ablaze and cause a great panic amongst the soldiers. It's at this time Zhao Zilong with his puny forces would attack Cao Cao's large army at Xinye and try to cause as much panic and commotion as possible. The armies of Cao Cao inside Xinye were panicking, there was fires everywhere, they were being attacked from a crazy force from the outside and people were being trampled to death as they try to escape out the east gate. As they escape out the east gate, on the road to the left they see a few thousand men carrying blue flags, and to the right they see another half carrying red flags. Cao Cao, already becoming familiar with the legend of Zhuge Liang, and having bear witness his tactics for himself, decided that this is certainly a ruse and he will not engage with them. But they needed a quick way to escape, as surely there was going to be more ambushes that lay ahead, so they escaped to the White River. Being pursued on the rear by Liu Feng and Guan Ping, they arrived at Boling Crossing. It's here where Guan Yu would hear the commotion of all the soldiers passing through the stream, and then he let the dam break loose. And many thousands were instantly killed by a great flood that washed over Cao Cao's army. And after all that was done, Zhang Fei comes in with an army for an ambush. What should have been a flawless victory, unfortunately, did not play out the way that Liu Bei and Zhuge Liang would have liked. Despite this huge success, Cao Cao still had hundreds of thousands of men, and Liu Bei was ahead of a caravan of a huge swarm of slow-moving peasants. His entire leadership circle was there. He was a slow-moving target, and Cao Cao with his elite cavalry force would be able to harass them. The tables are turned and Liu Bei is now in dire straits. Cao Cao is hot on his heels, and now Cao Cao has just attacked this large column of people, and order and disarray makes it into the ranks. With the civilians being mixed in with the military, no one was spared, and a great orgy of violence and bloodshed ensued. The Obey's family, being at the back of the train, was in grave danger. Zhao Zilong was sent to go find them, but already seeing that there was a huge chaos that unfolded, many people were already killed and injured. So Zhao Zilong, now behind enemy lines, looked everywhere. At last, he finds Liu Bei's wife and child, the wife being severely injured from a leg wound. Zhao Zilong would insist that she get on his horse to take her to safety, but she refused, fearing that she would slow down the rescue attempt. The main priority was Ardo, Liu Bei's child. While Zhao Zilong was single-handedly fighting enemy combatants, 
Liu Bei's wife will take the opportunity to jump into the well and commit suicide. For her, this is the only way that Jiao Zilong would make the difficult decision and just save her son. Jiao Zilong's skin already being torn to shreds and covered in blood would take Ado on horseback, would fight through enemy lines to reunite with Liu Bei. Jiao Zilong seeing the undefended, starved and exhausted civilians hacked to pieces by the wayside, he finally makes it back to the front lines where he sees Zhang Fei standing guard at Changban Bridge. Jiao Zilong making his way to safety, Zhang Fei would single-handedly defend the bridge. As Cao Cao's huge army approached, Zhang Fei started to taunt them. He then led a horrifying yell that would knock one of the commanders off their horse in fright. Who is this man? asked Cao Cao. His advisor would reply, this is Zhang Yide, also known as Zhang Fei. And then Cao Cao would remember what Guan Yu had told him when he'd slayed Hua Xiong. He said, this is nothing. My brother Zhang Fei can ride into a host of a million and slay the commanding general, no different to what I have done here. Cao Cao, recalling the visage of Guan Yu's unrivaled martial prowess, he thought if this Zhang Fei fellow is even close to being the equal of Guan Yu, then surely I'm in peril. And on top of that, he saw a cloud of dust behind the bridge. It's quite possible they've set up an ambush as well. So on hearing Zhang Fei yell, they decided to scram. This saved Liu Bei's caravan just enough time to regroup. And when they arrived to the river, Liu Qi would arrive with his boats and ferry them to safety to Jiangxia. Liu Bei and friends quickly need to formulate a plan. Cao Cao is hot on their heels after taking over Jing province, and they're going to be chasing after them pretty quickly. Owning a territory stretching from the Dongbei region of China all the way to Gansu province modern day China and the central plains, he now has a strategic advantage in which he's more easily able to conquer neighboring southern territories as they share the same river. And on top of all that, Cao Cao has just inherited the second largest navy in all of Han China. It seems to be so far that Cao Cao's conquest of the Southlands is just going to be a victory lap. Even if Sun Quan and Liu Bei are able to form an alliance, how are they going to be able to fight Cao Cao with such puny numbers? Enter Lu Su. Lu Su is an advisor of Sun Quan, and he's been tasked with forging a relationship with Liu Bei to form a counter strategy to Cao Cao. Seeing themselves on the exact same page, Liu Bei orders Zhuge Liang to immediately go back with Lu Su to the Southlands so they can prepare a strategy against an inevitable invasion. Lu Su, being aware of the internal political struggle between those that want to fight and those that want to surrender, Lu Su implored Zhuge Liang not to mention the fighting strength of Cao Cao, lest it deter Sun Quan from putting up a fight. But when Zhuge Liang meets Sun Quan, Sun Quan directly asks him, Since you were fighting with the Cao Cao, surely you should know how big his army is. And he directly asks how big it is. Without heeding Lu Su's warning, Zhuge Liang directly replies, Cao Cao's naval, infantry, and cavalry add up to more than a million. Sun Quan replies, Are you sure there's no mistake? Zhuge Liang says, No. In fact, before Cao Cao's war with Yuan Shao, he had 220,000 men. After Yuan Shao's defeat, he absorbed the remaining army of 600,000. Even if he was to get rid of the old and the weak, he should still have at least 450,000. In addition, from Ji, Bing, and Yo provinces, he trained an additional 380,000. After Jing's surrender, Cao Cao acquired another 330,000 naval and infantry. In total, Cao Cao's troops number no fewer than 1,400,000. Lu Su was not happy about hearing this. Sun Quan, quite troubled by this, then asks, Well, now that Cao Cao has Jing province, does he have any ambition for the Southlands? He replies, Cao Cao has positioned his army along the river and is training a navy. If he isn't after the Southlands, then who else could it be? Okay, Sun Quan replied. So should I fight, negotiate, or surrender? Well, if you are able, you should fight, if you think you can. If you can't, then you should surrender. Lu Su feels betrayed. Why would Zhuge Liang say this? And Sun Quan replied, So why doesn't your lord Liu Bei surrender then? And Zhuge Liang responds, My lord is different from you. He is of royal blood and a hero of an empire in distress. Even if heaven and earth were to collapse, my lord would rather die than surrender. With much offense taken, Sun Quan storms off. Lu Su tears into Zhuge Liang for this, but deep down, he knew that Zhuge Liang, he was up to something, and he had a plan to defeat Cao Cao. So Lu Su went off to console Sun Quan. Sun Quan recognized that Zhuge Liang was trying to provoke him. He was implying that whether or not he's likely to win or lose isn't the point. Resisting Cao Cao is a matter of principle. 
This is a matter of filial piety, the same filial piety we talked about in part 1. To be accused of disloyalty and not showing gratitude for the bounty that you've received is a great slap in the face to your ancestors. And Zhuge Liang, craftily pushing the buttons of this emotional response, was able to sway Sun Quan. Zhuge Liang wants him to fight for the reasons of loyalty, and now that they've sat down and they've exchanged apologies, Zhuge Liang can tell him the truth. Whilst Cao Cao claims to have over a million men and a thousand generals, no one's actually closely examined the actuality of this statement. In fact, to break it down, Zhuge Liang says, most of Cao Cao's troops are from the north. Upon arriving in the south, many were not accustomed to the climate and fell ill, reducing his force by one third. Second, attacking cities and fortifications along the way, they're all tired and their strength is reduced by another fifth. Now after all these victories that Cao Cao's had, Cao Cao's army has become arrogant. And the new recruits from Jing hate Cao Cao. Their loyalty was with Liu Biao. And Cao Cao came in more or less forcibly taking it over. And the heart of the soldiers isn't with him. Therefore, half of the army is overconfident, and the other half is discontent. His strength is reduced by another fifth. Now, Zhuge Liang explains, the navy is still the key to attacking the Southland, and for that, the Southland still remains supreme. So Cao Cao's strength is reduced by another third. In the end, Cao Cao's so-called one million is probably only one-tenth of its war potential. Surely, the combined forces of Sun Quan and Liu Bei could beat a force of 100,000. Now I think there's a certain art of persuasion that Zhuge Liang is employing. What if when he came in, he mentioned these facts straight away to Sun Quan's face? Well if he did, what if Sun Quan just thinks like all the other advisors? Well if I surrender to Cao Cao, then Cao Cao, you probably allow me to continue to administer the region? Maybe we just become a vassal state and we just pay tribute? That seems better than going through a bloody war, which we may not win, and even if we do win, we still have Cao Cao as an enemy. I think this really indicates Zhuge Liang, not just on the battlefield but also off the battlefield, employs these Machiavellian tactics to persuade the people around him. So Sun Quan is very happy to hear this, but he still needs to make a decision. A lot of the elites are still very split on whether or not they're going to surrender. On top of that, it hasn't been mentioned yet, Sun Quan is actually only 18 years old. He inherited the throne from his brother Sun Se, who recently died. The final wish of his brother Sun Se was that all military matters should go to Zhou Yu. So this Zhou Yu would become the defining element about whether or not Sun Quan and the Southlands would go to war with Cao Cao. Zhou Yu is the current Grand Commander of the Southland armies, so it's up to Lu Su and Zhuge Liang to go and plead their case to Zhou Yu. However, Zhou Yu seems like he isn't really up for the fight. He tells the duo that he's been thinking about convincing Sun Quan to surrender. So Lu Su and him start debating the advantages and disadvantages of whether or not the Southland should surrender. Zhuge Liang, pulling out another trick from his pocket, would enter the fray by chuckling. Why are you laughing? Zhou Yu asked Zhuge Liang. I'm just laughing at the ignorance of Lu Su. Zhou Yu's desire to surrender to Cao Cao, it's logical and wise. Again, Lu Su is not happy about this. Zhuge Liang goes on, Let me explain. Cao Cao is very skilled at warfare, and Zhou Yu isn't his equal. Only Lu Bu, Yuan Shao, Liu Biao, and my lord are fit to be his rivals. And all of those four but my lord are dead. Zhou Yu, angrily looking on, allowed him to continue. To prevent a war with Cao Cao, I have a plan, and it won't cost the Southlands anything. You just need to hand over two women to Cao Cao, and he will certainly call off the war. Zhou Yu, pricking up his ears, asks, Who? Well, Zhuge Liang continues, With each state that Cao Cao annexes, he take the prettiest women for himself. I heard on his birthday that he made a wish. He has only two wishes in life. The first is to reunite the nation. The second is to acquire two famous sisters, Xiao Xiao and Da Xiao. His wish is for these two ladies to entertain him in his old age. These two women are famous for their beauty throughout the realm. Xiao Xiao, however, is already married to Zhou Yu, and Da Xiao is the widow of the deceased leader of the Southlands, Sun Se. Zhou Yu understandably boils over with rage, asking his man to send over his wife to a villain so he can defile her. What is Zhuge Liang thinking? When Zhou Yu tells Zhuge Liang that Xiao Chao is his wife, Zhuge Liang feigns ignorance. Oh, really? Oh, I didn't know that. Oh, that's crazy. Wow. Zhuge Liang, he knew all along, and he continues to instigate Zhou Yu. I shall risk my life from a terrible retribution from you for telling you this fact, but I must say it. Cao Cao has a strange fetish. He doesn't like young pretty girls. He thinks they're no better than a withered flower. For example, when Cao Cao conquered Yuan Shu, he took his wife. 
When he conquered Yuan Shao, he took his daughter-in-law. When he conquered Lu Bu's territory, he took his wife Diao Chan. They were all forcibly taken to satisfy his bizarre fetish, and everybody knows about this. Cao Cao was in fact notorious for this. He had 12 women in his harem, and 9 of them were forcibly taken from their husbands, who were all powerful men that Cao Cao had defeated in battle. It's a kind of sadistic dominance fetish. Hearing this, this is all Zhou Yu could bear, and in a jealous rage, he swears not to live under the same skies as Cao Cao. The very next day, Zhou Yu would convince Sun Quan to declare war, and Liu Bei's camp scored a great victory. Zhou Yu, though, is not contented, but for another reason. He confines with Lu Su that this Zhuge Liang fellow is far too intelligent, and he's going to be a great threat to the Southlands. In his whole life, He's never met someone that's been smarter than him, and Zhou Yu is very smart. Him, along with Sun Tzu, would play an important role in the development of the Southlands region into a major power. Through intelligent military campaigns, Zhou Yu was highly successful in subduing the Southlands. Meeting this Zhuge Liang really put him at a sense of dis-ease. Zhou Yu knew all too well that Zhuge Liang was trying to provoke him, but it's the way Zhuge Liang carries himself, and the way he casually manipulates the people around him. So he's intent on killing Zhuge Liang. However, Lu Su insists that this not happen, considering that there's a major fight coming up against Cao Cao, and he's simply cutting off his nose to spite his face. Zhou Yu also understood this, and the only way he could maintain the Sun Liu alliance whilst also killing Zhuge Liang was to kill him indirectly, and he calls Zhuge Liang the next day to test him. He asked Zhuge Liang, in the Battle of Guandu, what was the key to Cao Cao's victory? Well, the key factor, of course, was cutting off Yuan Shao's supplies. Correct, replied Zhou Yu. In order to win with the smaller force, we'll need to cut off their food supplies. I want you to take your best generals and attack Cao Cao's supply base. Now Zhuge Liang could instantly see through this ruse. Zhuge Liang knows that cutting off the supplies of the enemy is a favorite tactic of Cao Cao, and he would have surely prepared for this situation by heavily garrisoning the supply towns. Attacking would be suicidal. However, Zhuge Liang knows how to get out of this sticky situation. With full understanding of Zhou Yu's murderous intent, he simply agrees to the mission. During this preparation for this raid, Lu Su comes to visit. He asks Zhuge Liang whether or not he thinks he can actually win in this fight. I'm capable in any form of combat, whether that be on water, land, cavalry, tactics, I can do anything. Whereas Zhou Yu, he can only fight on water. That's why he asked me to do this task. I even heard the local children sing. He goes, set an ambush, hold a pass, at these things, zijing is best. But for naval battles, river bound, Zhou Yu tops the rest. See, even the children know that Zhou Yu isn't capable of fighting on land. Lu Su, who would later go on to report to Zhou Yu, he asked what kind of things that Zhuge Liang was saying behind his back, and he related to him the children's song that Zhuge Liang came up with, and it made Zhou Yu go into a rage. Obviously, the exact effect that Zhuge Liang wanted to have. Zhou Yu, offended at this light, dismisses Zhuge Liang from the task and decides that he would do the ambush himself. Zhou Yu is more and more affected by jealousy of Zhuge Liang, claiming that he's 10 times smarter than I, and once again proclaims that he has to be killed. Lu Su again objects, saying, at least wait until the war is over. Cao Cao's navy is spot on the other side of the Yangtze River, so Zhou Yu gathers up a small force of his own to bring a fight to them, just to test the competency of their navy. Meanwhile in Cao Cao's camp, Cao Cao is a little concerned with the experienced Southland Navy. On top of that, Liu Bei, despite being a small force, it's made up of experienced veterans, with freakish generals like Zhang Fei, Guan Yu, and Zhao Zilong. So one of his advisors, named Jiang Gan, proposes a way to ensnare Zhou Yu. Jiang Gan and Zhou Yu were friends in childhood, and Jiang Gan hopes that he can win Zhou Yu over to Cao Cao's side. So he prepares a boat and he goes over to see Zhou Yu. And Zhou Yu, despite his arrogance, was very wise, and he instantly knew that this was a ruse. So Zhou Yu decides to play 3D chess with Jiang Gan and formulate a plot of his own. So Zhou Yu invites him to dinner, and he tells him, I haven't seen you in a long time, and although I never drink alcohol, tonight we're gonna get wasted. So they drink well into the night, and they drink, and they drink, and they drink, and they decide that they're gonna sleep on the same couch together, because they're buddies. And he's intentionally left a scroll with some very quote-unquote confidential information on it, just lying on the counter. And Zhou Yu does his best to convince Jiang Gan of his carelessness to throw him off guard. He made sure that Jiang Gan wouldn't be able to sleep by constantly tossing and turning, yelling out stuff in his sleep, taking up the whole bed, all with the intention to lead Jiang Gan to take a little look around. So Jiang Gan gets up and he looks around and he sees a scroll. He calls out to Zhou Yu just to see if he's awake, and Zhou Yu, pretending he's still asleep, mutters some gibberish. 
So he has a look at the scroll, and what he sees is a communique with Cao Cao's two leading generals in this fight, Sai Mao and Zhang Yun. Zhou Yu had discovered during a skirmish with Cao Cao that the efforts of their entire operation lay on these two men. These are two men that defected to Cao Cao after the fall of Jing province. Prior to this, Cao Cao had essentially no naval capabilities, and it's one thing to build up a navy, but it's another thing to supply it with experienced, able-bodied men. So Zhou Yu would try to implicate them in a conspiracy of treason against Cao Cao. So Zhang Gang, seeing this document, would go back and pretend to fall asleep, and in the morning, he disappeared, going back to see Cao Cao, and Cao Cao being furious, ordered the execution of these two leading generals. It was only after this that Cao Cao realized that he'd been done. He consoled himself by creating a ruse of his own. A brother of Sai Mao and a brother of Zhang Yun were called to see Cao Cao, and Cao Cao explained to them it was the ruse of Zhou Yu that led to their deaths. And in order to get revenge and win great prizes and adulations, they were to go over to the Southlands and pretend to defect on the basis of getting revenge for the man responsible for their brother's death. Around the campfires in the Southlands, people would proclaim the success of Zhou Yu's ruse. It was a great victory for them. However, there was one man that wasn't satisfied, and that was Zhou Yu. Zhou Yu, for him to be satisfied, wanted to know whether or not Zhuge Liang was able to see through his plot. So he asked for Lu Su to go and ask him. And Zhuge Liang, when he was asked by Lu Su whether or not he knew about this plot, he told him that he did know, but he implored Lu Su not to tell Zhou Yu. But when Lu Su went back to Zhou Yu, Zhou Yu pressed him hard and he demanded whether or not Zhuge Liang knew about his ruse. Lu Su acquiesced and told him the truth. As such, Zhou Yu was very dismayed. It wasn't enough that everyone regaled the success of his exploits. For him, what matters is getting one over on Zhuge Liang. But he just couldn't do it. Zhou Yu, being very melancholy about this, decides to hatch up another ruse to get Zhuge Liang killed. He calls Zhuge Liang and tells him there's a shortage of arrows. And with the battle coming up soon, they're definitely going to need more if they're going to defeat Cao Cao. So he tasks Zhuge Liang with getting 100,000 arrows. Zhuge Liang agrees to this. Zhou Yu says, however, that this is a serious matter, and these arrows could potentially determine the success of our campaign. Therefore, I'm going to need this to be enforced by military law. What that essentially means is that if Zhuge Liang fails, Zhou Yu has the right to execute him. So Zhuge Liang signs a document promising that he'd be able to acquire the 100,000 arrows, and Zhou Yu tells him he has 10 days to do so. Zhuge Liang, with another cunning trick up his sleeves, tells him, How about three days? Cold sweat already dripping down Zhou Yu's neck. He could tell something was strange about this. However, things had already gone so far, so they made an agreement. 100,000 arrows in three days. All military law is going to be exercised. Zhou Yu racked his brain, day and night, thinking, How is Zhuge Liang going to get 100,000 arrows in three days? After much deliberation, Zhou Yu finally calms down and realizes surely there's no way Zhuge Liang is going to be executed as a result of his failure. So Zhou Yu can finally relax. On the Zhuge Liang side, on the first day, he didn't take any action. On the second day, he didn't do anything either. And now, it's almost the third day. And he wakes up early in the morning and asks Lu Su to prepare a few dozen army boats. And he asks the boats to be loaded with haystacks. And when all was ready early in the morning, they would go out into the river and head towards Cao Cao's army. Lu Su, being terrified about this apparently suicidal situation, also has no idea what Zhuge Liang is up to. On this day, it was particularly misty, and vision wasn't very good at all. When the boats arrived an arrow shot away from Cao Cao's naval forces, they dropped anchor and started playing the war drums, challenging Cao Cao to a fight. Zhuge Liang, with only a few dozen ships, surely couldn't win this fight. Cao Cao, looking into the misty horizon, couldn't verify how many boats there were. If they sally forth, it could probably be an ambush. So he decided that instead of attacking them directly, they're going to shoot them from afar, and they attack with every arrow that they can. Apparently, each war vessel has over a thousand stiff bows that can shoot arrows very far and hard. And with the arrows blotting out the sun, the small naval force was soaked in arrows. When all the boats looked like big porcupines, they went back to shore and collected the loot. In total, more than 100,000 arrows were collected from Cao Cao. The legend of Zhuge Liang would spread throughout the Southlands, and Zhou Yu is very depressed by this. At this time, the two brothers of Sai Mao and Jiang Yun would come to the Southlands to claim defection to Zhou Yu. Zhou Yu, again despite his arrogance, was very wise, and instantly knew the ploy that was at hand. So again playing 3D chess with them, he would concoct a plan and he made the two generals and would set them up in his camp. When the brothers were with Zhou Yu, there was a meeting with all the generals. And up stands Huang Gai. You've been delaying fighting for too long and Cao Cao's gonna crush us. Zhou Yu tells him to pipe down, but, but Huang Gai went into a tirade against his lord. Zhou Yu, you've always been incompetent. Huang Gai says, You're arrogant and full of pretense. I served Sun Quan before you were even born, and if it wasn't for Lord Sun's leniency, none of us would have tolerated your madness. 
Zhou Yu had it and he gave him 80 strokes according to military law. The two pretend defectors were shocked by this, and as soon as they got the chance, they wrote to Cao Cao immediately of what happened. This, however, was all part of Zhou Yu's ruse. You see, the failure of these two defector brothers in convincing Sun Quan the legitimacy of their defection was the fact that they came with no family, they weren't injured in any particular way, there was nothing to prove that they had actually truly been wronged by Cao Cao. Zhou Yu wanted to take the Machiavellianism to the next level. He asked Huang Gai whether or not he was willing to participate in the battered body ruse. What that is, is you beat one of your commanding generals, and then you ask him to pretend to defect to your enemy. Your enemy, seeing the general's wounds, will surely believe that the defection is legitimate. So Huang Gai wrote to Cao Cao and told him all of what happened, and told him that he wants to defect. Cao Cao, being naturally suspicious of this, was put to ease when he received a letter of the two defector brothers. Huang Gai said he will come over with his force to Cao Cao on the eve of battle, due to the fact that it was too difficult to leave now under Zhou Yu's watchful eye. Everything was going well, and Zhuge Liang and Zhou Yu had decided on the best plan of attack for Cao Cao. They were going to use fire, with two of Cao Cao's leading naval generals out of action, with ample supplies taken at Cao Cao's expense, and a ruse set up to betray Cao Cao. All looked like it was going well, until the wind blew and Zhou Yu collapsed. Would this spell the end of the resistance to Cao Cao? With the Cao Cao's leading Grand Commander out of action, surely the Southlands was doomed, and the fate of the Han also. Doctors trying to understand what was going wrong with Zhou Yu couldn't put their finger on it, there was nothing that seemed wrong with him, but he looked deathly ill. Zhuge Liang comes to the tent to see if he can fix Zhou Yu's illness. He asks him if he's tried this herb and that herb and that doctor, but nothing seems to have worked. Zhuge Liang says, I only saw you just a few days ago, I can't believe you've become so suddenly sick. Zhou Yu responds, There are unpredictable vicissitudes in life, how can we know what's going to happen next? Zhuge Liang responds, That's right, just like the weather, how can we know which way the wind will blow? Hearing this, Zhou Yu displays a great level of physical discomfort. I feel a great burning sensation in my chest. To which Zhuge responds, Then you'll need a cooling agent then. No, I've already tried that, I need something else. Well, I have another cure that might help you. Let me write you a prescription. When he finished writing the prescription, he gave it to Zhou Yu. For this Zhuge Liang fellow was no ordinary human being. On his prescription was wrote a poem. For defeating Cao Cao, fire's best indeed. When all is set, the east wind will need. Suddenly, the root cause of Zhou Yu's illness was revealed. The success of the campaign relied on fire. However, Zhou Yu, standing under the night sky, feeling the wind press up against his face, suddenly realized that the wind on the Yangtze is blowing from the northeast, not the southeast. Currently, Cao Cao is stationed northeast up the river, so using fire ships against him would be suicidal. Upon realizing this, Zhou Yu collapsed. Zhuge Liang tells Zhou Yu that he has the treatment for this condition. Zhuge Liang related a story where he met a sage that taught him the magic of manipulating nature. When Zhuge Liang invokes his magic, he can make wind and rain do his bidding. Zhuge Liang requests that a 7-star altar be built on Nanping Hill, 9 spans tall and 30 spans in circumference. Surrounded by a guard of 120 people bearing flags, the altar is to be made of 3 tiers, each 3 spans high. On the lowest tier is to be placed the flags of the 28 houses of the heavens and the four constellations. On the second tier is to be placed 64 yellow flags corresponding to the number of diagrams in the Book of Divination. On the top platform are to be four men, each wearing a Taoist headdress and a black silk robe. Below the altar, there to be 40 men holding flags, umbrellas, spears, lances, yellow banners, white axes, red banderoles, and black ensigns. On the appointed day of the ceremony, Zhuge Liang would choose a propitious moment, bathed his body, and purified himself. Then he robed himself as a Taoist, loosened his locks, with solemn steps, he ascended the altar. He faced the proper direction, lighted the incense, and sprinkled water in the basins. With this done, he gazed into heaven and prayed silently. The prayer ended, and he returned to his tent. Three times a day he would ascend the altar, but still there was no sign of wind, and the day of battle was coming close at hand. With Zhou Yu's confidence in Zhuge Liang's ritual, his health returned and he resumed military duties and decided now was the time to attack Cao Cao. He ordered his land forces to attack Cao Cao and was simply waiting for the wind to change directions so they could make a naval assault. After a few days, the wind started to change direction, and a great southern wind blew northeast. Zhou Yu commanded that as soon as the wind changes direction, Zhuge Liang is to be arrested and executed. With the wind blowing in their favor, there'd be no need for Zhuge Liang at all, and he can be gotten rid of. As soon as the wind blew and Zhou Yu's men came to look for Zhuge Liang, he was nowhere to be found. He had disappeared. Huang Gai, now seeing that the wind had changed directions, got ready to go and pretend to defect to Cao Cao. He loaded his boats with flammable objects. 
sulfur, saltpeter, fish oil. And with a great wind pushing them northeast, Huang Gai with his navy sallied forth to Cao Cao. Seeing Huang Gai's forces coming, Cao Cao felt on top of the world. Everything seemed to be going to plan. He has two spies in Zhou Yu's camp pretending to be defectors. The Southland's leading general, Huang Gai, is just about to defect over to him and cripple the fighting capacity of the Southlands. On top of that, he's found the ultimate solution. Many of them were getting sick due to not being accustomed to the rough waters of the Yangtze River. This was a great problem for Cao Cao. However, an advisor told him that if he chained all the boats together, the feeling on board would be no different to that of land, and the rugged northern warriors will feel like they're on their own turf and fight to maximum capacity. Cao Cao had every reason to believe he was going to be victorious. But Zhou Yu's ships, they kept on rolling upstream. They seemed to be going awfully fast, and they're heading straight for Cao Cao's cluster of ships. Cao Cao starts getting concerned that this might be a trick. They're going way too fast and not pulling up to the shoreline. Instead, they're making straight for Cao Cao's fleet. He ordered the warning shots of arrows would be shot into Huang Gai's fleet. But Huang Gai's fleet didn't stop. They fired all the arrows they could, but they just kept on going forward. And then, the flames lit up. Huang Gai torched all the flammables. They were no different to flaming arrows hurtling at alarming speed towards Cao Cao's fleet. With the intentions clear and all to everybody of what's happening, they did the best they could to release the chains, but it was too late. Crash. Flaming timber was sent everywhere as the first wave of ships exploded into Cao Cao's front lines. Subsequent waves of flaming exploding boats would crash into the front lines, building up a great wreckage of burning debris in the middle of the river. With the strong northeastern gale, the fire spread up the river and Cao Cao's fleet was devastated. Checkmate. It was game over for Cao Cao. As for our Taoist wizard friend, Zhou Yu's men were still looking everywhere for him. Zhuge Liang knew all along about Zhou Yu's murderous intent, and knew as soon as he fulfilled his use, he'd be discarded. So as soon as the ritual was completed, he went straight to the river and saw Zhao Zilong waiting for him. With Zhuge Liang's mission complete, him and Zhao Zilong would sail off into the horizon. So can Zhuge Liang actually use magic? Or was it just a trick? That's enough for part 3 guys, we're gonna leave it for the next video. As always guys, thank you very much for watching. Oh fuck, I can't believe you've done this. And if you like this video, please make sure to leave a like. And to see part 4, make sure to subscribe. Thanks and I'll see you next time.